Morning, Raymond. Morning, Commission. Good morning. I had to unmute myself. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Marine Fish Advisory Commission business meeting. It's Tuesday, October 18, 2022. Uh, introductions, announcements, and review of agenda. And we'll move right on to two, review and approval of meeting minutes for the August 18th, 2022 draft business meeting minutes. Jared, did you have some corrections? Yes, so if you recall last month, we did not approve the um, August business meeting minutes and I was tasked with going back and making a couple minor edits to those minutes and, and um, putting them back out as draft uh, that included incorporating some typographical errors that Khalil had uh, passed along to me and um, as well as addressing um, your comments on herring on page seven, the herring stock assessment. Both of those have been incorporated into these August draft meeting minutes and recirculated, and they're now uh, pending. Any further amendments by the commission are now uh, ready for review and approval. Uh, and just recall that both of these minutes will have to be approved by a uh, roll call vote. Thank you, Jared. Does any more edits to that August 18th draft business meeting minutes? If not, we need a motion to approve. I'm not seeing any hands raised, Mr. Chair, if you want to move to a motion. Uh, yeah, that we approve the uh, August 18th, 2022 draft business meeting minutes, and that's going to be a roll call vote. Khalil here, motion to approve. Tim Brady, motion, uh, second the motion. Thank you. Jared? Khalil? Yes. Tim? Yes. Bill Amaru? Yes. Bill Doyle? Yes. Lou Williams? Yes. Sookie Sawyer? Abstain. I'm sure, I don't think I was there. I believe that's the full commission today. We have uh, Shelly and Mike are both absent. Thank you. Other than one abstention, it's unanimous. Yes, that's correct. Moving on to the September 13th, 2022 draft business meeting minutes. Need a motion for approval or are there any edits? I, I have comments from Mike Peardnock, uh, who is absent today, but asked me to, um, to raise these edits on his behalf. Um, there's uh, two typographical errors in here. Uh, the Northeast Science Center should be referred to as the Northeast Fishery Science Center. And when talking about um, uh, his comments on warming, warming waters may affect growth in recruitment rather than recoupment. So I'd like to make those two, ed those two typographical edits um, on Mike's behalf and amend the final minutes with them. So we would be looking for a uh, motion to um, amend the minutes with Mike's edits. Motion to amend the minutes. Motion to amend the minutes. That's Khalil. I need a second. Yep, Tim Brady, second. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Khalil. Khalil? Yes. Tim Brady? Yes. Bill Amaru? Yes. Bill Doyle? Uh, abstain. Lou Williams? Yes. Tookie Sawyer? Yes. Motion passes with one abstention, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jared. Once again, uh, moving on to comments, I want to, I appreciate and I want to thank everybody for their attendance today and hopefully their participation in this meeting. I'll turn it over to Commissioner Ron Amadin. Good morning, Chairman Kane, um, 
Thank you for having me here today. I'd like to uh, recognize DMF for their successful restructuring of the, their management team. Um, this is something I've been working with Director McKinnon on for three years. And uh, if, if he isn't already busy enough with everything that he has on his plate, um, he did do a, an, an exemplary job of uh, reviewing all of the management positions that were necessary and um, stuck with it throughout a very long period of time of getting it through the many layers of approvals. Um, as most of you know, DMF has some of the top scientists and biologists in the country. Because of that, um, we're constantly got people out there looking to poach us. Um, and without a good management structure, it makes it a little bit easier for outside sources to do that. So a good management structure will ensure retention of some of our best staff by creating a visible path for career advancement. Um, it will also greatly improve their ability to recruit people from outside. So the importance of this restructuring um, cannot be understated. I think uh, this will be a career moment for Dan. So I want to uh, recognize and congratulate Mike Armstrong, Bob Glenn, Story Reed, Kevin Creighton, and Stephanie Cunningham on uh, the successful ascension to these management positions. And I also wanna congratulate Dan um, for having the vision to create this structure. And I'm sure this will uh, be a huge benefit to the board of commissioners as well. So uh, thank you all and congratulations. And that'll conclude my comments, Chairman Kane. Thank you, Commissioner Amadin. Questions for the commissioner? No, I'm seeing any hands raised, Mr. Chair. I'd like to thank you, Commissioner, for a better explanation. Uh, I have a much better understanding now. I know that that's been an issue for years, what you mentioned, people being poached, leaving DMF, and uh, hopefully, this will work for the best for the entire DMF staff and the state and this commission. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you, Chairman. I'm going to move on to law enforcement. Who's that, Lieutenant Bath? Yeah. Yes. Moran, who's on yep. today? Uh, actually, both of us are on. I think uh, Lieutenant Colonel Moran is going to have uh, something to say a little bit later, but I'll just give a, a, our brief synopsis. I um, um, do apologize. I won't be able to stay through the entire meeting, but um. I, Previous meetings, I think I, I, I hate saying we have nothing to report because that kind of seems like maybe uh, for lack of effort or something. So I did a quick dive into some of our statistics. And just, just last month, um, we uh, looked like we responded to uh, or responded, made, um, there's 1,262 calls for service for marine fisheries related issues. Um, of with that, I think just shy of 30 resulted in some type of a, a citation. With that, like any statistics, it's kind of deceiving. I mean, I had uh, two guys that hid fish, threw them overboard and whatnot. And after all the citations and whatnot were issued, that, that just counts as one call and one citation. But um, I thought 1,200 something calls is, um, is more relative to, to what we do and whatnot. Some of the other issues we're having, uh, yeah, so to talk uh, is kind of, I think, halfway done. That's always been one of those um, uh, species that people like to, I don't know, take advantage of. Um, some of the other, sh I think, shellfish issues that I was made aware of, um, it seems like, I don't know if it's dealers getting sloppy or whatnot, but with some of the tagging issues, um, for whatever reason, um, the dealers might not have those tags uh, attached after receipt, which just generates some problems because that it ends up in, in seizures and destruction of product. Also, I think it was mentioned a couple meetings ago, um, some of the frustrations with maybe the delay in adjudicatory hearings. Um, uh, I, I think the mechanism we have for Jared is, and DMF is going through now is, is, is 
extremely efficient compared to anything else. I, uh, just as an example, I had a, a finished up a, a jury trial uh, uh, earlier this year that I had cited five years prior. So uh, to say the wheels of justice move slow is um, uh, kind of an understatement, but I think if if you're frustrated with um, adjudicatory issues, it's uh, in the courts, it's far worse. So I, I, I think we're, we're doing pretty well as far as uh, DMF's handling with adjudicatory stuff. Um, but with that, I don't, if there's any specific questions um, regarding cases, uh, like my mother always asks if I'm, uh, if anything interesting happened and I say no, because by this point, nothing's interesting, but with 1200 calls that we responded to, I'm sure something is interesting to somebody, but I can't cover all of them. So like always, if there's some specific case re, um, questions, I can give you a call or, or answer some specific questions, but any beyond that, I have uh, nothing further. Questions to Lieutenant Bass. Khalil? Khalil, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Lieutenant Bass, can you can you give us an update as to uh, how things are moving along regarding recruitment and increasing the uh, the force? Oh, good question. So we have uh, our three new hires um, have just finished up their their training and moving into field training. I think this week, um, Lieutenant Colonel Moran might be able to answer better. I, uh, last I heard, there were. Um, still in the process of trying to hire 10 more officers, but I haven't heard any of the details. Um, yeah, so so we've got three officers, uh, like the Lieutenant said, going into field training. Um, we haven't identified whether they're going to a an inland or coastal district yet. We're still in the middle of uh, sergeant promotions, so we have to see how everything pans out with that. Um, we do have one candidate that's starting the Randolph Academy, uh, Police Academy in December. And um, we're, we're on board with, I think, 11 new officers for 2023. Okay, I guess the question I want to ask is that are we increasing or are we replacing folks that are leaving the force. As we've said in the past, letters have been written by uh, Chairman Kane and myself to the secretary and, you know, uh, you know, emphasizing the importance of increasing the force. And I just want to know if we were just maintaining the number or bringing in people to replace those that are leaving or are we actually increasing the absolute numbers into the force? I, I, I think we're just above maintaining, so we haven't made any great gains. Um, you know, we're, we're at a point right now where we've got a lot of older people or, that are reaching either 65 or, 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 or have, you know, they, they just don't want to do it anymore. So, um, yeah, so we're, we're, we're ahead of the game, Khalil, but not, not that much. Thank you very much. Question. Do you have that um, picture I sent to you? I just want to talk about that. <clears throat> yeah, give me one moment, Pat. Okay, well, while Jared's looking for that, I, I just wanted to give kudos to one of um, my officers. So we were looking between 
2020 and 2021, um, we were approaching between 10 and $13,000 um, for each of those years for, for blue crab violations. Um, the number of violations was astounding. Um, this officer took it upon himself. He had a friend that did um, 3D printing and he had that friend make a, uh, a five inch gauge says five inches on one side, Mass Environmental Police at the top. And any contact, he had, he had ordered a hundred of them. And any contact he had had uh, with anybody blue crabbing out in the field, got one of these gauges. Um, I liked the idea and uh, I had a thousand more ordered that we gave out to everybody out in the field, um, everybody that we encountered that was blue crabbing. Um, and I'm happy to announce that in 2022, we saw a 50% reduction in, in violations. And those contacts that we had given uh, the gauges to in the past, um, they had the gauges with them. So it, it turned into a good thing. And I was just glad for his, um, for the way he was thinking and getting this done. I had a picture that I had sent to Jared, but I don't think we can pull it up. Well, congratulations, Pat. That's enforcement going above and beyond. Yeah. Someone thinking outside of the box and it, it, it made a big difference. Uh, Pat, I will find that I'll send it around to the commission. I'm just struggling to locate it in my files right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the update, Pat. Any other questions for law enforcement? Ray, if I may. By all means, you're recognized. <laughs> I, I want to uh, recognize and agree with the Lieutenant Colonel's assessment of the numbers and um, his forecast for the future. I think we're at a, a critical time right now where this organization, along with the rec panel, may want to reach out to some of our stakeholder groups to help organize them um, to address these concerns. And I would suggest that it may be prudent for them, as well as yourselves, to engage in conversations with groups such as the Legislators Coastal Caucus Committee to address those concerns and request that they look into these matters and potentially uh, advocate for you folks. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Jared, can you send uh, send commission members a list of this Coastal Caucus group so we know who is on it and who we should get in touch with? Yes, I can work on that, sure. Thank you, Jared. Any other questions for enforcement or comments? I'm not seeing any other hands raised. Director McKiernan, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman Kane. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank Ron for his support for that restructuring effort and for his uh, keen insights about uh, retention. And um, he's right. And I, I think he really nailed that issue. So thank you uh, to Ron for that. Um, so today we don't have a very heavy agenda, um, but I am glad we're convening so we can keep you up to date on some of these important developments. Uh, first off, we're getting to the end of the fishing season and the calendar year, and Story will be giving a presentation of uh, quota utilization for those species that remain open. Some of the conversations that will come out of today's presentation uh, kind of flow into the permitting subcommittee, which is scheduled to meet uh, uh, later this week. Um, and, uh, you know, as we underperform some of our fisheries quotas, it's important to take a look at some of the permitting issues to see if that's part of the, the, the issue. Um, Bob Glenn is going to be uh, discussing some of the protected species issues that always seem to 
be in play, but it's getting even more intense with recent court decisions that have put a lot of unprecedented pressures on our commercial fishing industry, notably the lobster trap fishery. Uh, it's been a very challenging few weeks, uh, beginning when the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch released its final assessments and red listed all lobster trap fisheries, as well as a Jonah crab fishery and any other fin fish fisheries that take uh, uh, their catch with pots and traps that are rigged with vertical lines. The Monterey Bay Aquarium did this to bring attention to the plight of the North Atlantic right whale. And it obviously has set off a real um, whole bunch of uh, substantive arguments uh, in the press and, and among the industry groups. Uh, meanwhile, because of the recent federal court decisions, the feds are undertaking new management steps to attempt to reach what's called PBR. And you've been around a while, a lot of you commission members, you've heard the expression potential biological removal. It's a very low, low number. It's less than a whale a year, and it's uh, all deaths caused by humans, which includes shipping and fishing. Uh, there are proposed rules that NIMS is going to be developing over the next year that will um, try to uh, further regulate fixed gear fisheries, uh, despite Massachusetts already drastically reducing risk uh, through our previous rulemaking, including the seasonal closures and the introduction and mandatory use of weak rope. You have forwarded a letter signed by Bob Glenn and I asking NIMS to credit Massachusetts with the conservation measures that took place in 2015. Um, we were pretty uh, surprised and disappointed that uh, NIMS's recent uh, strategies would only credit uh, the, the actions taken since 2017. Uh, and the biggest thing that we did, uh, you know, in the area and historically was that 2015 Massachusetts Bay restricted area closure. It's the one that goes Cape Cod Bay down to the backside of Cape Cod, uh, east of Nantucket, and includes uh, Stellwagen. So it's uh, it's it. This is this is a debatable issue, and we've weighed in. We've we've communicated to the congressional uh, uh, staffers as well. Uh, I'm going to be attending the National Meeting of State Directors and NIMPS leadership next month. And so I look forward to that meeting to have one-on-one -on -one face time with many of the key decision and policy makers at NIMPS, particularly on this issue. Um, next month's ASMFC meeting is gonna be held in person in New Jersey. Uh, Raymond and I are gonna be uh, commuting down together uh, to Long Branch, New Jersey, I believe. I'm not very familiar with New Jersey, but I know Ray's got, uh, he, that's his old stomping grounds, right? Ray, New York, New Jersey, so you'll get us there. The most significant actions there are going to be on Menhaden with the new uh, addendum and, and an update on striped bass assessment. Uh, those are going to be the highlights. Um, there's an old issue that keeps rising up from the ashes. It's it's pretty confusing. I just want to bring the commission's attention to it. It has to do with surf clam dredging and the uh, use of hydraulic dredging. Uh, about 15 years ago, Provincetown uh, enacted municipal regulations uh, that banned the use of hydraulic dredging. This is a, a clam dredge that, that um, it, uh, liquefies the sediment with, with, uh, with hoses and nozzles so that the clams are easily harvested when the, when the cage with the knife travels over them. Um, there's been a lot of concern in Provincetown about the boats fishing off of Herring Cove Beach. And they successfully uh, went to court and argued that the Wetlands Protection Act allows them to, to um, regulate this. So the fishermen have a set of DMF uh, regs and DMF permits but even though there's nothing in the DMF uh, regulation statutes uh, or, or permit conditions that says they can't fish in Herring Cove Beach, that's exactly what the Provincetown uh, uh, commission, uh, Conservation Commission did. And so here we are um, about 15 years later. And, and so the, the analogy I'll use is that the dog finally caught the car. So now though, the, um, there's at least one vessel that is submitting their application much like they would be if they were going to dredge an inlet. Uh, they're, they're submitting the application and it's now what, right? So the, uh, there's, a, there's a possibility that this could be approved with, with an order of conditions, but this 
particular conservation commission is has a complete new set of characters than the that which uh, enacted these rules years ago and they're looking for guidance and so we're working with them working with the town and at the heart of this was a study done by the Provincetown Center for Coastal Studies to to uh, do some controlled fishing and study the effects of fishing and we're hopeful that those results would be made available before a decision could be made. And uh, that study was, was begun five years ago and we're hopeful that this data could finally come to the surface and we could uh, manage this uh, with, with some better clarity. Uh, however, I will say that uh, I'm interested in, in amending our surf clam management strategies. Uh, one of the areas I think that the surf clam fishery can sometimes get uh, uh, criticized for most likely, uh, you know, unfairly, and that is their impact on eelgrass beds. So what we want to do is we want to delineate all the eelgrass beds that we can and keep those vessels out of those beds and do that with the use of the trackers, the same trackers that we're about to require the, um, the federal lobster permit holders to, to deploy. And we think that could uh, bring a bring about a lot of uh, a lot more confidence that the boats are where they should be and they're not doing um, damage to um, any submerged aquatic vegetation uh, on the ocean floor. Um, next month is going to be a meeting of the shellfish advisory panel that can take up the tagging issues that Lieutenant Bass had mentioned earlier. So I'm looking forward to that. And then back in the office, we're embarking on a new permitting year, which begins in late November where all the permit renewals are mailed out during late November, early December. You may know that the office that we occupy at 251 Causeway Street is expected to be closed early next year. And as a result, we've decided to relocate the permitting function that we perform in three locations down to two, which means uh, our, our permitting function is gonna be enhanced at the Gloucester and at the New Bedford field stations. And, uh, and we will be permitting uh, out of the Boston office uh, beginning uh, this winter. Uh, and also the new permits for 2023 are gonna have a different look uh, as uh, Story, uh, Anna Webb and Kevin Creighton have all been working on working with IT to develop uh, a new permitting system. Uh, and the new permits are gonna print off on a full page eight and a half by 11 because we have so many rules and regs and permit conditions and, and uh, endorsements. You can't fit them very well on the on the smaller half page that we've been using for years. So those are my comments this morning. Uh, I'll take any questions from the commission. Questions for the director. Suki Sawyer. Suki yeah, thanks. Exercise. Thank you, Rick. Uh, somebody you mentioned, Dan, and I hope the commission is still listening about the uh, losing our uh, percentage of uh, qualifications because of they're not going to let us use the uh, beginning of the uh, closed area in Cape Cod Bay critical habitat on the right whale closure. I was hoping the commissioner could go up the ladder and get the governor to address this, you know, to somebody. And uh, cause this, there's nothing more important right now going on with the lobster industry than losing this qualifying, you know, these percentages of our totals here because of this feds are not gonna allow us to use the, the uh, closed area because it was before 2017, which is kind of asinine, but I just hope the commissioner can relay this message strongly up to the governor and the governor can take a stance on this and maybe influence some of our federal delegation. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, Suki, I'd be happy to do that. Um, in fact, if you'd like uh, to put together a small delegation, uh, maybe yourself, Beth, uh, whomever else, I'd be happy to meet with you folks to discuss the details and create a path of communications to ensure that that gets to where it needs to get. Um, you can, however you folks want to structure that, either the chairman uh, and or Beth can reach out to me and we'll work with my calendar to make that all happen. I appreciate that, Ron. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think Beth's listening in here, so we'll get right on it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Suki. Thank you, Commissioner. Any I'm other questions? Any other comments, Mr. Chair? No other comments. No other questions for the director. 
uh, discussion items. 2022 quota managed fishery performance update. And I guess I'm gonna recognize Mike Pierdenoff. I think he is on now, Jared. I'm not seeing him. Uh, I just got a text from him. Sorry, I late. Oh yeah, here we go. I throw him up to panelists now. Thank you, Jared. So who's gonna take the quoted managed fishery story? Yep, story read. I'll take that, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, and good morning, everyone. Good morning, story. Jared, can I share my screen? Julia, you're currently host. Can you make story co-host? Thank you. All set. All right, thanks. So we'll go through pretty quickly um, the handful of quota managed fisheries that are still open here. Um, the first will be bluefish. And um, this we've pretty much fully utilized our original Massachusetts quota. Um, we're at 96.5% or about 97% as of this morning with some updated numbers. Um, Nicola's been keeping in touch with the one or two participants over the past few weeks um, to see, uh, you know, what the availability of the fish was. And pretty much after that blow uh, last week, the fish moved on. So we anticipate we're just going to hover right about here. Um, we'll keep monitoring it, but it sounds like most of the uh, heavy participation has gone as the fish have moved on. So pretty much full utilization here. Black sea bass. Um, this is numbers that were run last week. We're at 72.5%. That's gone up another 5% since then with some reporting that was done overnight. Um, so we're still, this fishery is, is still active. Landings are coming in. And you can see on the right that um, the 2022 landings in black are approaching 2021, and we do have a higher quota this year. So they'll continue, it'll continue going um, as long as the fish are available and we have quota remaining. Fluke landings are right around 46%. Um, we went to a higher trip limit as of October 1st of 10,000 pounds to accommodate the offshore fishery. That has not yielded any bump in landings, as you can see. In fact, landings have tailed off. There's been wind the past week and a half. Um, we'll see if these landings pick up, but we do have that increased um, possession limit of 10,000 pounds as of October 1st. Horseshoe crab bait landings are at about 72%. They've tailed off. Uh, we talked about this one at the last meeting and some of the participants in this fishery had switched to biomedical. Um, that could be resulting in these lower numbers here. So um, we'll be talking to the fleet about that over the next month or two, but um, we're at 72% now. Uh, the Tatag fishery is ongoing. Um, actually, this slide says 50% landed. It's now up to about 57% as of this morning. Uh, we're getting a lot more requests for second allotments of tags right now. So this is usually the time of year where the catch rates really pick up or time of the fall when the catch rates really pick up. So um, we'll be watching this closely over the next few weeks. Um, as the catch rates pick up. And you can see in the graph on the right that um, this is the time of year where the landing ra landings rates do seem to pick up a bit. And I think we're seeing that now based on the tag request. So we'll watch this one closely. And then we just wanted to give a, a quick update on the spiny dogfish fishery um, because Nicola's got some news for us on the um, the quota for this fishery for the next fishing year. Um, and right now, 
the Massachusetts landings are at about 3.3 million pounds of the overall northern states. I believe it's the northern states quota that we're showing here of 17.1 million um, or about 20% utilization. Even though we're only showing Massachusetts landings here, um, we are the bulk of the landings in this fishery. So um, this is pretty close to the overall landing. So we're at 20%, 3.3 million. Uh, and Nicola can either weigh in now or in her update about what that quota outlook is for next year. And that's my last slide. I think Nicola might want to weigh in now. Nicola? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I'll save the update for on spiny dogfish for um, I have a, a slide that looks at that. Um, but I did want to comment on the black sea bass and flu quotas for next year, which have already been set um, because of the commercial recreational um, allocation amendment, um, the commercial share for black sea bass is going down. And so our quota next year will be around 740,000 pounds, I believe. So that's quite similar to um, the landings this year. Um, conversely, um, Fluke, the um, commercial recreational allocation amendment didn't make as dramatic a shift in the, the two sectors allocations. And so our quota for Fluke next year will be very similar to what it was this year. Thank you, Nicola. I'll, I'll save questions to you when you do your lengthy presentation. Story, any questions for Story on his presentation? Mike Beardnock. Michael, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Story, for your presentation. Just a quick question about TOG. Uh, the commercial fish that are targeted, are they typically the smaller size for market or larger? What's the typical mix associated with uh, that species? It's a good question. I don't have that in front of me. Uh, Bob Glenn's on. I don't know if, if you have any ideas from... Um, market sampling on that. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, yeah, what we see is primarily because the most valuable fish are the, those fish that are sold for the live market. The preference among the dealers is to buy fish that are just over minimum legal size. So, uh, it, it, you know, most, most fishers are trying to target fish, you know, in that 16 to 18 inch size range or as you know, small as possible and still legal to, to get into the commercial market. Um, They'll, they will take larger fish, but they're, they're not preferred. <clears throat> Good, Michael. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks. I see Khalil's got his hand raised. Khalil, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, could we go to the spiny dogfish, please? Slide. Um, this is the, the number seems awfully low. Uh, the quota nowhere near what is asked for in the quota. Uh, story, can you can you can you tell me the the effort is how many how many boats are out there actually looking for spiny dogfish and 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 out of ignorance, what is the importance of spiny dogfish as far as a managed species? Well, I think that deserves us to look a little deeper and maybe compare previous years so we can see it visually. But I think effort is a bit down now. Um, the, the price is a bit lower than it's been in previous years. This is really a volume fishery. Um, the price per pound can be 20 cents, um, slightly above. It depends on European export markets. And that's been... Um, kind of mixed up over the past couple of years with the pandemic and things like that. And then it's about the availability of the fish and other opportunities for the fishermen. So there's a variety of reasons there, um, but I think we can, we can get a better look at that for you uh, in terms of what's been going on recently, I just don't have it now. And then I think that's an important look though, because of what the news that Nicola is going to tell us. So. So hey, sorry, could I add? Um, yeah. I think one of the interesting features of this fishery is that there's a trip limit. It's as, it's been increased to 7,500 pounds, but it's that's still fairly low. You had mentioned this is a volume fishery, but the management scheme has deliberately um, constrained the, the 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 daily trip limit to favor kind of the near shore 
uh, vessel interests. And I don't think that uh, with the low price that if the fish aren't available very close to shore that it, it, it pays enough to go chase them. I mean, I think the price is around 20 cents. So, um, you know, a 7,500 pound trip limit uh, at 20 cents doesn't bring a whole lot of income. So I think that that's uh, a combination uh, and, and obviously they're going to be dropping the quota, but um, you know, utilization, you know, we deal with this in some of our other species when we're not seeing the, the effort or we're not seeing the, the, uh, the, 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 the um, production, we, we turn the dial on whether it be days off or trip limits or, or even like some of the permitting constraints. So that's, those are other factors in play as well. And I think, you know, Ray may know more. Um, I think this, we're down to a single processor at this point. I think they used to be two or three. I believe we're down to one. And so it's worth investigating what's going on with this because it is a, an East Coast fishery, but I think almost all the fish are cut in New Bedford. Yes, uh, you're right, Kay. And I have a couple of hands raised, but I'll add lib. Uh, Martyr, Martyr, Martyr has gotten out of the processing business. So you've only got one processor and that's sea trade. Okay, I'm gonna move on. I see hands raised. Lou Williams, you're recognized. Yeah, thanks, Kay. Yeah, just just a comment on the uh, the fluke fishing and another year where the boats, you know, didn't even get fifty percent of the quota. Um, <clears throat> I just think it's something we should look into. I've gotten a few calls from the guys fluke fishing and this year with the uh, price of fuel and everything. You know, it's it's just a shame to leave this stuff on the table. So I think we should be looking at <laughs> trying to maximize that quota next year. You know, and and get some ideas or whatever, but the, the, I just I just think it's something we should look into instead of continually going <clears throat> only catching up for us uh, half the portion that we're, we're allocated. Thanks. Thank you, Lou. Nicola. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was I was able to quickly pull up some um, some participation levels for federally permitted dogfish vessels. And there, there definitely is a decline in active participants over the years. Um, the advisory panel has commented on that in, in terms of there being other more lucrative fisheries available and including some new fisheries like a white shrimp fishery in uh, Virginia, North Carolina, um, that's siphoning off some, some effort. Um, but if you look back about 10 years or so, there was over 200 active of federal permits in the dogfish fishery. And in, in 2020, it was only 87. So certainly a decline in participation is contributing to the reduction in landings. Thank you, Nicola. Pat Moran, your hands raised. Yeah, while we were sitting here, I had, I had reached out to two of the bigger food dealers down here in New Bedford and just to see where they're at. Um, there's a maybe five or six vessels that are that are participating in the, the 10,000 pound limit. Um, the Rhode Island boats, they said, are still squid fishing. Um, the biggest they've had so far is a 5,000 pound trip, and they're looking at about a dollar 50 a pound. Thank you, Pat. Question. Mr. Chairman, Khalil here. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and th th this spiny dogfish graph is, is uh, very important because it can be deceiving. Some people look at this and say uh, the, 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 the way under the quota because this, the spiny dogfish population is way down. Or you can say, you know, the, 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 the catch is way down because of low, low effort. So when one looks at a graph, you've got to look at a graph and you've got to kind of interpret it in a couple of ways, not just look at it and make make a judgment as to what that graph is showing because the spiny dogfish population may be doing very well, but the price per pound is so low that folks are saying, I'm not gonna spend the effort to do it. So I'll, what I'm trying to say is that when folks look at a graph or look at scientific information, they've got to look at both sides of the picture here to, to, to come to a judgment call on it. And, um, and this goes with all of the managed species so it's just that it's an it's an interesting uh graph and and um i just wanted to make that that statement regarding you've got to look at a graph and the scientific uh, information in several different ways thank you 
Thank you, Khalil. Questions or comments for Story on his presentation? Not seeing any further hands, Mr. Chair. Well then, thank you very much, Story. Congratulations on your promotion. You're welcome, and, uh, thank you. And we'll move along here, protected species management update. Yes, good morning, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Jared, if you want to roll the slide deck, thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to just try to provide you with a quick update this morning about uh, some, some major events going on in, in the protected species arena. The, these include um, proposed changes to the Atlantic Lodge Whale Take Reduction Plan, uh, proposed changes to the NOAA Fishery Ship Speed Rule, and is also an update on our incidental take permit application. Next slide, please. Yeah, as, as Dan mentioned, uh, this has been a really challenging last uh, six weeks to two months here at DMF relative to protected species. There's a lot going on over North Atlantic right whales. Um, and in the, one of the big kind of landmark recent decisions in the in the Bozberg case, I'm um, excuse me, the Bozberg decision by Judge Bozberg down in the DC court in the case of the Center for Biological Diversity versus NOAA Fisheries, uh, the judge in his ruling invalidated the 2021 biological opinion in the conservation framework that NOAA had put together. Uh, and they found, he found that NOAA Fisheries violated the MMPA because it failed to reduce mortality below PBR, which is 0 0.7, within six months. The six months is a critical uh, factor in that it's, it's actually baked into the, the law, the, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, um, and requires uh, NOAA fisheries to to achieve PBR for any any species, uh, any uh, endangered species within that time period. Um, right now, our current mortality rate um, is so high that in order to reach PBR, it requires a 90% reduction in that rate. Uh, NOAA uh, the judge then ordered NOAA fisheries to work with the pl plaintiffs to find a remedy. Uh, NOAA has was working on that. Um, they have uh, filed a request um, to have until December of 2024 to complete rulemaking with a final implementation date of 2025 for all fixed gear fisheries on the East Coast from Maine to Florida. So that inclu includes all lobster trap fishing, all whelk fish pot fishing, all gillnet fishing, um, uh, other crab species up and down the coast. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's everything from Maine to Florida. It's, it's very extensive. Um, the plaintiffs have not responded to that request yet. So we, I don't, we don't have an update as to whether or not that time frame is acceptable. On September 9th of this year, NOAA Fisheries filed a notice of intent uh, to initiate rule, new rulemaking in the Atlantic Large Whale Take Reduction Plan. And they're, with that, they have a goal of reducing the risk of serious injury and mortality by 90%. And that's the target to get it below PBR. Uh, NIMS opened a very brief scoping period from that announcement that ended on October 11th. Next slide, please. Um, and from that, DMF provided... Uh, pretty substantive written comments that Dan, as Dan indicated, was distributed in the materials today. Uh, and the major themes were that we're asking for a full accounting of all measures on uh, fixed gear fisheries and mass that are already in place. And so some of the, in the initial risk reduction calculations in the NIMPS model, the decision support tool, um, didn't account for some of the measures that DMF and the Marine Fisheries Commission had already put into place. And th those things include the, the gill net closure that we had put in place, um, as well as the, the, the closure in the, the Mass Bay restricted area. Um, we were not getting any conservation credit for the closed period of our wealth fishery, um, among a number of other things. And so we were asking full, kind of a full and accurate accounting of all those details. One of the major points um, that we're, we're working on is we're asking NOAA fisheries to calculate and provide risk reduction credit for the original Mass Bay restricted area. Uh, earlier in the meeting, uh, Suki alluded to the fact that um, in the last round of rulemaking in 2019, Mass DMF <clears throat> um, strongly advocated for the, at the TRT meeting 
to get credit for this closure. And there was near unanimous consensus among the TRT to, to in fact provide uh, DMF with and, and the Massachusetts lobster fishery with that credit. Uh, in sub subsequent rulemaking procedures internally, there was a decision made somewhere within NOAA to not allow credit for that closure because it occurred in 2015, which is two years prior to the what they're calling the 2017 year reference period. Um, we think that's completely unacceptable. Uh, we've wrote substantive comments on that, and, and I've, I've personally reached out and advocated as strongly to you know NOAA Fisheries staff who I have access to um, to change that, and we're trying to gain traction there because uh, it's it's just unacceptable that that particular closure is the most important uh, protection that right whales have in the entire U.S. It it, it is the it hosts the world's largest aggregation of whales to to not give mass fishers credit for for that closure is just unacceptable, and so we're continuing to work uh, along that vein. Um, we're also asking them to update the mortality estimates to include 2020 and 2021 data. The current cal PBR calculation is based on mortality rates from 2015 through 2019. And that includes the years of 2017 and 2019, where we had really, were part of the unusual mortality event where we had really large scale mortalities occurred from both shipping and, and, and entanglements, but they were all primarily up in the Gulf of St. Lawrence and Canadian waters. Um, since that time period in 2020 and 2021, uh, mortality rates are substantially lower than lower entanglements and ship speed deaths. And so if they updated that information and use the most current uh, mortality data, the overall average mortality rate would likely be, um, would decline and be more favorable, which would mean that the amount of necessary risk reduction would be less. And so we're, we're advocating strongly for them to, to update that and use the best available information in this case. Um, along that same vein, we're asking them to test the, the, the model they use is called the decision support tool. And currently that decision support tool uses whale sightings data from 2010 through 2011 which sounds pretty reasonable, you'd want to use a long time series, except that the problem is, is that during that time period, whale distribution has not been, has not been stable. In other words, we've seen fairly strong trends and shifts in whale distribution in that time period. Um, and as a result of that, using such a long time period can kind of create artifacts in the model in that uh, it may highlight areas that are uh, as being really important to whales, based on data that, you know, that from the early part of that time series that in that now we don't really see whales using that. And so an example would be kind of the western portion of southern New England waters, on, you know, near Cox's Ledge, where in 2010 through 2015, say we used to see a lot of whales. And then now in the last five years or so, most of those whales are to the east. Uh, and so we're asking them to kind of take a more accurate accounting by breaking up that data into five-year stanzas and to look at how that affects the model results. Hey, Bob, and could you just clarify? I think you may have misspoke. It's 2010 through 2021? Yes, that's correct. Okay, that's right, thanks. My apologies. Uh, and then finally, the uh, it was also within that comment letters that we're requesting that NOAA Fisheries negotiate with the courts plaintiffs to delay action until empirical data are collected on the effectiveness of weak rope. Um, and so and other buoy line marking uh, requirements. And, and, you know, this is something, you know, Dan really um, po pointed out. And it's a really good point in that uh, we, we've put these measures into place for weak rope as well as, as gear marking measures. And it's our, our view that these are, are going to be largely very effective. We, we don't see small diameter rope on right whale entanglements in modern times. In the last decade, more than 70% of entanglements on, on right whales have occurred with rope over a half inch in diameter. And now with the addition of, of you know, very intricate gear marking and the fact that our, our lighter diameter 1700 pound breaking strength rope will largely be effective at, uh, you know, right whales should be able to break that fairly easily. We expect that, um, you know, 
mortality rates attributable to inshore fisheries is going to be negligible. And, and so we just think in this case, um, we may be jumping the gun and not effectively uh, taking account for some of the things we've already already done. And we're, we're asking NOAA Fisheries to, to consider that. Next slide. Um, so as I said, uh, NOAA Fisheries proposed, uh, set out a notice of intent to initiate rulemaking. Um, and it, the scoping period was very short. It, it ended it, it, on October 11th and it only started in, in, in September. Uh, DMF hosted four scoping meetings with fishing industry leaders. Uh, we had over 75 fishermen in attendance and we had uh, four, as I said, four meetings, one in Gloucester with LMA one lobster fishers from Mass and New Hampshire. We had one in Plymouth uh, with LMA one and LMA OCC lobster fishers from Mass. One in New Bedford with LMA two, LMA three, uh, and as well as whelk pot fish trap fishers from Mass and Rhode Island. And then we had uh, another one in New Bedford uh, specifically for Southern New England monkfish and skate gill netters from Mass and Rhode Island. Um, and you know, it was, they were very well attended. Uh, the, I, the output or the input we got from fishermen was just was was amazing. Given the dire circumstances of facing a 90 percent risk reduct reduction, they still rolled up their sleeves and came to the table to offer uh, additional measures for consideration. Um, uh, and, you know, these these measures included uh, time area closure extensions into federal waters adjacent to the mass closure extension of the mass week rope rules into federal waters, uh, new trawling up and or paneling up options. Um, and we had discussions on buoy line caps and buoy line reductions and, and discussions of minimum trawl size. Uh, and so we've kind of made a large list of all the measures that, that the fishermen uh, asked for input back on from NIMS from, and we sent them along with a comment letter the NIMS modeling team is going to work on all those iterations and provide those results back to us for future considerations. Um, and then finally, so next steps is, is that in November, the Atlantic Large Wheel Take Reduction Team meeting is November 14th through the 18th, and the team will, will be presented with a whole host of, of risk reduction management scenarios and their results related to percent reduction credit um, and for the whole range basically from all fisheries from Florida from uh, to Maine uh, and then we'll have a couple of weeks in between or barely two weeks in between to try to come back to our constituents vet that uh, work with you know industry members again to kind of vet you know one to get an account of exactly where we're currently at and what measures we might need to take to, to get there. And then in December, on December 1st and 2nd, there's another, an additional two day TRT meeting whereby the team will, will vote on those options and provide recommendations to NOAA Fisheries for rulemaking. Next slide. Um, concurrently uh, going out the same time is the, the NOAA Fisheries proposed modifications to the ship speed uh, rule. Uh, and along the same lines as the entanglement risk reduction, NOAA Fisheries is proposing modifications that will result in a 90% risk reduction in vessel strikes. Um, the current rule, the 10 knot or less speed limit in, in seasonal management areas only applies to vessels 65 feet and greater. The new rule will, uh, proposes to apply to vessels 35 feet. Um, and in the seasonal speed zones, uh, which are in the the map to the right um, have been substantially increased in time and space. And the, the one that'll be of most impact to uh, Massachusetts and Ma Massachusetts based fishermen, commercial recreational fishermen is the green area, the, the known as the Atlantic seasonal speed zone, which they're proposing to extend a 10 knot speed limit in that entire area from November 1st through May 30th. Um, uh, that's probably the, the most prominent. There are other changes to the dynamic areas that, that are related to uh, detection of whales uh, via acoustic detections kind of out near the continental shelf where um, detections could result in 
kind of dynamic based um, temporary speed restrictions. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, public comments on this have been extended until October 31st. Uh, DMF is working on those comments and, and concerns range from uh, that, you know, the, uh, we feel that the economic impacts were not fully captured or fully vetted. Uh, concerns that the scope and scale is very large and, and not very surgical. Um, and also concerns about the enforceability given that vessels less than 65 feet do not require VMS. And then last slide. And then one, one uh, some positive news on the, on the, on the uh, protected species front is an update on our, our incidental take permit. So we, back in July of 20, this past year, we submitted our first rough draft of the uh, incidental take permit or specifically our habitat conservation plan, which is the meat of that permit uh, to NOAA fisheries. Um, and then this just, a few weeks ago, back in September, we received our first uh, formal feedback from NIMS on it, and the overall the characterization is that it was thorough and well written. Um, DMF is working through and addressing the other comments in there, uh, and we're, we're with a plan to formally resubmit this to NOAA Fisheries uh, in December of 2022. Uh, once we do that, once we formally submit it. To NOAA Fisheries, that kind of starts a, a clock that's mandated as part of the, the process in applying for the permit. Um, and so once we do that, the NOAA Fisheries will have, you know, 90 days to, to respond and then to publish that in our incidental take permit application in the um, Federal Register. And that kind of starts the formal process of vetting through NOAA Fisheries. And with that, I'll, I'll take um, any questions. I, let me. Uh... Khalil. Thank you, Jared. Uh, Bob, that was an uh, uh, interesting, complicated, and interesting presentation. There's a lot of, a lot of moving parts to that. Could you go back to the graph with showing the, the states and the, um, with the, the next to last slide. The ship speed rule one, I believe. Okay. That's, yep. what, that, that's the one right there. Um, you have to fine tune this a little bit for me. Um, as, a, as a charter boat captain at one time, I'm now retired. And when you know we're running and gunning to get to, to, to the various schools of fish that, that I, I targeted striped bass. Um, and my, my boat was a 20 footer, 20 foot center console. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, uh, look at this, what's going to be the speed reduction, uh, it says 10 knot or less rules currently applied to vessels 65 feet and greater. So that would, that particular rule, that current rule only applied the reduction only to, to apply to votes that boats that were 65 or larger. Is that correct? The, the current rule does, yes. The proposed rule, they're looking to extend that to vessels 35 feet and larger. Okay, and then what was the rationale then moving it down to 35 feet and larger? Uh, the rationale was based on, a, they did a thorough review of all the ship, ship strike injuries and mortalities. And what they found was that there was a substantial proportion of mortalities and serious injuries that, uh, that were being caused by vessels less than 65 feet. And so, uh, initially, when the rule was put into place, it was the thinking that it was, you know, that it was only large vessels that posed a real risk. Uh, but subsequent analysis has shown that that's not accurate, that you know, smaller vessels hitting whales at a high rate of speed actually does result in, um, you know, mortalities to, to right whales. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, because what, what concerns me is that uh, they, they went from 65 to 35. And then there are there are there are vessels. I mean, we're traveling that you know fairly fast fast speeds. I know I, I was mostly inshore, primarily inshore. And um, and I I, I I guess if my boat were to hit a whale, I didn't see it. Hit a whale or or an ocean sunfish or something like that. I'm going to do some serious damage to that fish as a, as a twenty footer. And I was just you know you answered the question, but I was just curious as to how they. They, they chose 35 rather than say 25 feet or or 30 feet. Was it was it an arbitrary decision or strictly statistical? 
I mean, it's, it just seems that seems like an arbitrary number. Yeah, I, I think that the exact length of 35 feet, I'm, I'm not, it does seem fairly arbitrary. I'm not, I don't know the exact rationale for that versus say 33 feet or 36. I, I don't know the rationale specifically. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. Michael Pierdock, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there's a number of different national organizations uh, that are a mix of uh, maritime as well as recreational or commercial or so on that are responding or addressing uh, this proposed measure. The disconnect I've seen uh, from a fishery regulatory standpoint that uh, many at the federal or state level uh, have disconnected the fact that the maritime <laughs> industry would be significantly impacted by this separate from the uh, fishery, just the uh, you know, thing just at the fishery level. Um, and as a result, some at the fishery level are not commenting on it or trying to address it. I know that uh, many National organizations are trying to show that the economic impact of a closure from Massachusetts to the Virginia North Carolina border during that period of time would have a yeah, like impact on that. the maritime industry or those that recreation. What's that? Yeah, you broke up, Michael. We're not receiving your entire comment when you talk. All right, I'll try to call on. All right, I'm going to move on to Lou Williams, and then we'll get back to Michael when he calls in. Lou Williams, you're recognized. Yeah, thanks, Ray. Uh, Bob, Bob, I just had a question for you. Sure. Um, I've been reading online that um, you know some of the main guys are talking about uh, some changes in the uh, in the rules, and uh, one of them was the weak link below the buoy. Is that true? That Noah wants that removed. Um, so yes, that that it, it that is true, and that it they already removed it in fall of 2021. Uh, so for this current fishing year in federal waters, uh, you're not required. Um, to have that 600 pound weak link at the buoy any longer. Um, Jared is, is, you know, working on in Massachusetts. We maintained that for this past year because NOAA fisheries did not re remove that requirement for other trap pot fisheries. And so since we're, our fishery is now classified as its own fishery as, as lobster trap and other, you know, and whelk pot, fish pot fishery together. Um, for consistency sake, we maintained the 600 pound weak link uh, for the for 20 for the 2022 season in Massachusetts. Uh, but it's part of a current uh, rulemaking package Jared is putting together to consider removing that requirement well, for mass fishers in 2020. Okay, okay. because my my comment on that is, uh, <clears throat> I think it's. I mean, call me conspiracy theorist, but I think it's part of the agenda because um, you think about a whale gets hung up in an end line and it's sliding along and it gets to that buoy and it just pops. I've had plenty, lost plenty of buoys the two years they were dredging Boston Harbor. And like three years ago, about three years ago, I had an end line. I knew I had didn't have a weak link up by the buoy. So <clears throat> I had run out of them. So anyway, when I... The, we were having problems with our ends getting hit by the tugs and barges coming out of Boston. Well, that trawl got hit before I hauled it again. And all the other ones that just pop off. Your buoy's gone, you, you know, the breakaways, they have rip, ripped apart. That one there, that trawl got towed. I lost two traps on it. And my point being is not having that weak link on there is going to, if you do get into a whale, is going to cause problems. And I, I, I just want everyone to know, I don't believe that NOAA's agenda aligns with the fishing industry. 
when they're doing things like that and not crediting in Massachusetts with the uh, closure down south we put in in 2015 because that, that was a real head scratcher to me because to me, I think they want to see some ropes from our lobster gear on there on a whale. That's what they're dying to find because they, I, I, I Googled it online, every whale entanglements, giant rope, poly rope. Um, it's just, it's just, I just be, we better be careful because there's an agenda as far as I'm concerned at NOAA and it's not good for the fishermen. Thanks. Thank you, Lou. Suki Sawyer, you recognize. Yeah, thanks, Ray. I just like to comment on Dan, Dan and Bob, how great of a job they've done in the staff because Massachusetts has been ground zero from the beginning of all this right whale stuff. And they've been very deep in the details of what works and what doesn't work. And this argument about whether we should get credit for the uh, critical habitat is uh, very important to us. And the vision has been right out front for that. So I'd like to, again, thank Dan and Bob and their staff for the great job they've been doing for the lobstermen of Massachusetts. Thanks. Thank you, Suki. Director McKiernan. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to point out to the commission that that we at DMF have a vessel speed limit in uh, Cape Cod Bay proper, which is the area that we uh, see dense aggregations of whales. And, and we, this rule is in effect during March through April with a potential to extend it a little further into May should those whales stick around. Um, so we're, you know, we, we've taken a similar action. However, we're, we really tried to focus it on places that we expected whales to be. And I think, you know, consistent with Bob's comments and, and Mike Piernuck's comments, this rule is, uh, is, is incredibly, uh, you know, broad, uh, including areas like Nantucket and Vineyard Sound, which, um, you know, there's, there's just absolutely no, uh, evidence uh, re in recent years, or, or maybe there was a couple of whales in Vidget Sound and Nantucket Sound a decade ago, but that, that's basically a whale-free uh, area. And so um, just, just so the commission's aware that we, we have an analogous rule, we don't have a minimum vessel size, but we did exempt some of the embayments like <clears throat> Wellfleet Harbor, Barnesville Harbor, Plymouth Harbor, those kind of things where we don't expect whales to be. So in some ways they're kind of emulating us, but they went way beyond anything that, that we would have ever have done in terms of its, its impacts. Thank you, Dan. I feared not. Michael. Jared, what's going on with Mike Beardnock? He's got his hand raised. I just promoted him to panelists. Yeah, I'm working on it. Mike, Good you morning. should be able to unmute. Thank can you, you, Julia. Hello. We yeah, can we hear you. you, Mike. All right, I hear an echo. I apologize for this problems this morning. I'm sorry. Um. I'm hearing a crazy echo. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to add that there's a number of different organizations nationally that are looking at this because the economic impact to the maritime industry is, as well as the fishery industry, whether it's rec for hire or commercial, uh, with a with a ten knot limit from Massachusetts down the North Carolina Virginia border. Uh, is significant and I know that many uh, organizations are working on uh, getting a better handle on what that economic number is. Uh, the basis of that is the hopes that one would show that as we know and, and DMS is, is, is to be uh, commended for all the work they've done to protect right wells and continue to do and the, the research and the details that they have that there's many times that these whales are not even near uh, Massachusetts or down in the, the North Carolina or, or Virginia area. So why then would you implement such a me measure up and down the coast, coast wide? A few things to point out that was clarified at some recent meetings that the Coast Guard has the ability, independent of vessel monitoring systems, systems to 
assess speed limit. So th that doesn't require that you have that on your boat in order to do it. That's the first thing. So if there's a speed limit issue that you're worried about, that can be monitored. Second thing is that the economic impact is, is, is significant, which in my opinion it is, and more details are forthcoming, that the, the need to provide the technology to, to track the whales whether it's sounding device, whether it's heat sensing devices, uh, uh, because they all have a heat signature and then they have to come up to, to get air, that to do such and then add a buffer to that and have a rolling closure zone that you have to have notification as we do now, not, well, not a closure zone, but a speed limit, that that cost to do such is uh, reasonable based upon the economic impact of what this would do. Uh, one has to remember, this is from Massachusetts down to the Mid-Atlantic. So if you're a recreational a charter boat that's going to go to the canyons, you're not going because the, the amount of time to get out there is such a distance that they, you're just not going to go. And then there's, there's other examples of that, whether it's uh, near to shore or not. Uh, but I, I, I just wanted to add that to the to the discussion and uh, I look forward to the letter from DMF that hopefully can integrate the, the whole entire mass maritime impacts versus just fishery impacts um, and the cost associated with such. I mean, I, I, I want to protect right whales and, and they need to be, but it, this needs to be reasonable and not over such a distance that uh, could have impacts to, to the U.S. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Suki, I see your hand is raised again, or is that from your previous comment? That's from previous, Ray, sorry. Thank you. Any no, other comments or questions? Not seeing any, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Bob. Always informative. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And congratulations on your promotion. Thank you. So it looks like we're going to keep keep staff. They're not going to be leaving to go to work for Noah or anybody else. Thank you for accepting the position, and you're doing a great job. And I know the lobstermen are very appreciative of your dealings with Noah and the TRT. Moving on, protected species management update, Dan. No, I think next is um, interstate fisheries management update, right? Because Bob did the protected species. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah, interstate fisheries management. That'd be update. Nicola. Nicola, yes. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning again to all. Um, I'm going to um, cover just three species, a, a quick return to the spiny dogfish discussion that we already started, and then um, kind of a look forward to um, Menhaid and, and striped bass at the ASMC annual meeting. Um, so to get back to uh, dogfish on the next slide, you'll see um, a comparison of the, um, the quota, coastwide quota uh, as the orange line and the landings, the blue line. Um, mm. And uh, the action that's taken place so far with regards to next year's quota is that the Mid-Atlantic Council voted uh, earlier this month for a 12 million pound quota. So it's quite a decline from the roughly 30 million pound quota that's been in place for the last two years. Um, however, it, it is still above the landings. Um, you can see 2021 was right around 10, uh, 10 and a half million pounds and the 2022 landings are tracking um, similar to 2021. Um, so that, that quota reduction is a result of um, the, the SSC, uh, the Scientific and Statistical Committee of the Mid-Atlantic Council, um, using uh, the, the spawning stock biomass index from the Northeast Fishery Science Center trawl survey data to, to reduce the uh, acceptable biological catch. We are waiting on a new stock assessment for a spiny dogfish, um, but there are some indications that the, the stock has declined. And so the, the SSC took a, uh, an ad hoc approach this year to, to reduce the, the ABC um, 
to um, about 40 percent. Um, and then after you account for uh, Canadian landings and discards and recreational catch that resulted in a, a 12 million pound quota recommendation from the council. So this will still have to be taken up by the New England Council and the ASMFC, but um, that's the early indications for next year. Um, next slide, please. In terms of um, going back to the slide about our, our our New England region's share, which is 58% of the coastwide quota. If that um, carries forward the, the 12 million pound quota coastwide for next year, that would result in a, a 7 million pound quota for, for next year. So it doesn't look based on current landings that within our region of Maine through Connecticut that would um, curtail the fishery early. There are other states, though, um, such as Virginia, that tends to struggle with its allocation when the quota is reduced. So I do expect that there'll be a, an increase of requests for quota transfers next year if these quotas um, carry forward. So moving on to striped bass. Um, the oh, back one slide. <laughs> um, the um, You'll recall that Amendment 7, um, when it was approved earlier this year, did not make any changes to the regulations. Um, initially, there was talk about seasons or reduce, minimizing the, uh, the slot limit or other measures, but the, the decision was made to wait for the, the 2022 stock assessment to determine if additional reductions were needed to rebuild by the 10-year the timeline of 2029. And uh, important provision of that, uh, which we're calling the Armstrong rule, uh, was that the board could respond through board action as opposed to a longer addendum process if um, additional measures were needed to rebuild so that that could be done um, next year. Um, so the, the board at this coming meeting is going to focus on the stock assessment. Um, I'm going to kind of jump to the, the end results. I'm, I'm skipping over a lot of the details, um, but I wanted to give you some of the, um, you know, what the results look like to, to know whether or not, you know, additional measures are forthcoming. But two important things about the stock assessment is that the Maryland Juvenile Abundance Index, which is the graph you see here, the last three years um, classify as recruitment failure. They're below the 25th percentile of the time series. And as a consequence of that, um, interim F fishing mortality reference points have been calculated based on a low recruitment regime. And in addition, that low recruitment um, assumption is being used in, in the stock assessment projections. So that means that the recruitment values and the projections are just pulling from a time period of 2007 forward, um, where we are considering that to be um, a low recruitment regime. So the results that you see on the next slide are the for the stock status. Um, again, these are preliminary. They need to be approved by the board. But what we're seeing is that um, the stock is still overfished as expected, although that top graph does show you some increasing trend in the, in the terminal years. Um, but the change from the last assessment and, and based on the reductions that were implemented in addendum six is that the stock is no longer experiencing overfishing um, and that the fishing mortality rate has been reduced um, to below the target level. So that, that's the, the good news is that the measures from addendum six were, were effective uh, in achieving what they wanted to. Um, the other good news on the next slide is in the projections, which are indicating that um, you know we will rebuild in time based on these projections. These are these are three different projections. On the far left is a projection if we continue to fish at the current rate of 0.14. In the middle is if we increase fishing mortality to the target rate of 0.17. And on the right hand side is the projections if we increase F to the threshold rate of 0.2. Um, but on the on the left, we're seeing where that blue line 
crosses the 50% probability threshold. Um, that's showing that we have a greater than a 50% probability that SSB is going to rebuild in 2025 if we continue to fish at the 0.14 rate. And that by 2029, there is a 78.6% probability that the stock will have rebuilt. Um, if the fishing mortality rate increases a little bit to 0.17, the target level, then we'll still get to um, the rebuild status by, by 2028 and have a 52.5% chance the stock is rebuilt in 2029. Um, and not surprisingly, if we fished at the F threshold rate, um, which is designed to achieve the SSB threshold as opposed to the SSB target, then we would not be getting to the SSB target in the, in the timeline that's shown here. So um, the, the outcome uh, that we expect is that the um, the stock based on these projections will rebuild in that 10 year timeline and that additional reductions in catch are not necessary at this time. So um, this assessment will be presented to the board on November 7th. And I would encourage you if you want um, all the details and the inputs and the caveats about the, the outcomes and the projections to, to tune in then. Um, and I believe that the um, briefing materials and the document will be, I believe they're going to be posted to the ASMC website um, later this week. Um, and then the last slide is just going to touch on Menhaden um, and the final action, as Dan alluded to, on the draft addendum. Um, this addendum is addressing several issues in the commercial allocations and some of the other provisions for the commercial fishery. Um, there's been changes in the stock distribution and availability since the um, three-year reference period that is the basis of the allocations. Um, there's latent quota in a number of states, particularly those that have a, a default you know, half a percent allocation and, and no or uh, commercial fishery. And then there are other states like ourselves, like Maine, that have been very reliant on, on quota transfers and the set-aside the episodic event set aside and the incidental catch and small scale fishery provision that allows the 6,000 pound trip limit after a quota is taken. Um, and, you know, those landings have been um, so high and, and, you know, in Maine in particular that the TAC, the total allowable catch is being exceeded due to those landings. So um, I, I am optimistic that there is going to be um, some change in the state allocations. Um, DMF would rather see that in our, our state specific quota as opposed to an increase in the um, regional shared episodic event set aside program because that's difficult to manage um, among states that are so different in their participation and effort levels such as Maine and, and Mass are. Um, and I also, you know, I think that there will be some changes to the, the, the small scale provision in terms of what gear are allowed. Um, you know, all the um, interest right now is on the per se landings in, in Maine, um, which are amounting to, you know, five times their state allocated quota. Um, and I also think that there will likely be some additional um, management triggers that if, if the TAC is exceeded, um, due to those landings, the board will continue to return to that provision and, and see if additional changes need to be made to it. So the other thing that the board will be taking up um, is, is setting the total allowable catch for the next three years. Um, the next benchmark assessment is in 2025, so I think the board probably will set three-year specs. And the projections um, are suggesting to me that the board will likely vote for some increase in, in the TAC, which will probably, you know, what, what may help make the uh, the allocation discussion a little bit easier if there's an increase at the same time. So coming out of this meeting, um, you can expect that uh, the state scoping meeting and public hearings will take place this winter in order to make some changes for 2023, um, unlike striped bass, which looks promising that we can um, stick with our current measures for at least another year or two. So that is all I wanted to cover today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Nicola. Questions for Nicola? Khalil, your hand Thank, you, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Nicola, obviously I'm, I'd like you to go back to the uh, <clears throat> the graph with the straight bass. 
please. Um, yeah, oh, that, that's, that's good right there. Um, in, in layman's terms, it, <clears throat> uh, it amazes me, it amazes me how the analysts can uh, take the statistics and, and I'm not being sarcastic, it's, I'm just amazed at uh, the statistics and the an analysis that goes into coming up with the graphs and coming up with, with the terms. Can, can, can you tell, in, in layman's terms, can you tell me, in the past we're saying striped bass were overfished, but now all of a sudden they're not overfished. Can, can you tell me, in, so it's something in a way that I can understand it, how that came about, how that, that statement came about that they're not being overfished. I, I can be, um, because they are still overfished. So the, the stock biomass has not changed much since the last assessment. Um, that's what that top graph is showing. The biomass is still below both the target and the threshold levels. What has changed is that the rate of removals from the fishery has declined as a consequence of the reductions that were put in place two years ago. The recreational slot limit along the coast, the 18% reduction in, in the commercial quotas, those measures reduced the landings um, by more than 18%, which was the target, um, and led to the rate of removals um, dropping so that the stock is no longer experiencing overfishing. Could, could that could the fact that they're that they're not experiencing the catch in previous years is is that the that the effort is down uh, and that, that that they're just not able to catch the numbers of striped bass that they caught in the past? I don't know. Um, well, well the, the the landings were reduced um, by let's see twenty total fishery removals were reduced by twenty four percent from 2017 to the next, over the next three years or four years. Um, one of the indices that goes into the assessment is a recreational catch per unit effort um, index. And I, I don't have that in front of me, but um, you know, it, it, it may be some combination of uh, the measures in place as well as reduced availability that contributed to the reduction in landings. It, it, to me, it's very complicated. We'll probably have to sit down one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Uh, thank you, Nicola. I appreciate it. I'm not seeing any further hands raised, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Nicola. I guess I'll see you at ASMFC. Moving on, Federal Fisheries Management Update. I presume this would be Melanie Griffin. It is. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, everyone. I'll just wait for the slides to come up. Good morning, Mel. <clears throat> well, I'll just while the slides are coming up, you know, as usual, I'm going to run through our regional fisheries issues that involve the New England Council, and I will summarize decisions from the September meeting in Gloucester, and I'll preview the December meeting. Um, or at least the work that's leading up to it, given we're some time away from that council meeting. The September meeting certainly lived up to its hype. It was a packed agenda across all four days uh, and some days going well into the evening. Eric Hansen made his debut as the new MAF member and he was certainly quickly engaged in council debate. Membership also reelected its existing officers for the 2022-2023 management year. So that's Eric Reed and Rick Bellavance uh, remaining as our chair and vice chair respectively. And mass members, John Papillardo and I will continue to serve on the executive committee alongside Maine, alongside Maine member, Megan Ware. And that's been a pretty productive and functional group. So look forward to continuing that work. Next slide. Moving on to FMP specific updates. I'll start with Scalas. The council declined to, do, to advance an amendment to develop limited access leasing. Three motions were considered, but ultimately rejected. The first motion that we thought about would have allowed temporary leasing in the event of vessel breakdowns and other vessel related catastrophic events uh, and only in those cases. That motion failed. Six mo members voted yes, 11 voted no. 
The second motion proposed developing an amendment for voluntary leasing that was, quote, fair and equitable to all stakeholders and reasonably calculated to promote fishery conservation, unquote. The motion really didn't put any constraints on the alternative that could be developed for leasing, uh, and it actually failed for lack of a second. The third and final motion that was considered proposed initiating an amendment for leasing, but did attempt to narrow the range of alternatives that could be developed. That motion failed on a vote of one to 15 with one abstention. So the council will not be taking up leasing again unless the issue is added to a future priorities list and approved as a scallop priority by the full council. Uh, the council finalizes those annual management priorities in December. And uh, currently, we're expecting to consider a wide range of issues related to the scallop fishery and its 2023 priorities. Uh, it may choose to prioritize measures to address catastrophic losses next year, but leasing is certainly only one way to address that. And actually, the committee is going to have to kind of pro provide some clarification given the, uh, the null vote on uh, using leasing as a, a tool to achieve that. So. Um, the other kind of remaining aspect of this is that the proponents of leasing had submitted a petition for secretarial action in January of 2020. And that kind of sought to circumvent the council to develop leasing. Secretarial action generally takes place if a petition is found to have merit and meet certain standards for secretarial action. NIMS responded in April of last year, so 2022, that a sec secretarial action would neither be necessary nor appropriate at the time, given the council was actively addressing leasing. Um, NIMS didn't conclude whether petition was with or without merit. So it's, you know, whether a pathway to leasing remains through sec secretarial action is somewhat unclear at the moment. Certainly the council's vote and record of discussion on leasing would inform any conclusion by NIMS on merit. So we'll just have to see how the agency uh, proceeds with that. In terms of other work, non-leasing work going forward, the immediate task before the council is completion of framework 36. Uh, and that's uh, our fishery specifications for the 2023 fishing year and default for 2024. To the right uh, are some of the taskings that have been given to the PDT to develop in terms of access areas. Uh, the PDT APN committee, as I said, are working this fall to finalize alternatives and the council will, will provide its recommendations uh, in December. I just say one note about the 2023 scallop fishery in general, and that is that the biomass is the lowest observed since 1999, less than a quarter of its 2017 peak. This isn't a surprise given we've had an extended stretch of below average recruitment since 2013. So, uh, you know, what does this mean for the 2023 fishery? The ABC likely will be less than 44 million pounds. Each year, we've kind of been steadily declining by about 10 million pounds from the time series high of 100 million pounds. I would note though that the bright light is, we have had recent observations of recruitment through the, the uh, scallop surveys, and those are the best that we've seen since 2015. Uh, the earliest those incoming year classes would be available to the fishery is 2024 or 2025. So hopefully we are on the up and up after this, this um, nadir in the fishery. If you want to listen in as the framework continues to be developed, the committee next meets, I think it's next Friday, the 20 or Thursday, the 27th. Uh, next slide. So ground fish, similar to the scallop framework 36 timeline, the council is rolling toward the December approval of ground fish framework 65. This is a fishery specifications document for 2023 to 2025. Again, the PDT APN committee will be continuing to develop alternatives these next two months. At the September meeting, the council did pare down the document by removing any rebuilding measures for Southern New England, Mid-Atlantic winter flounder. That's why I've, I've uh, kind of uh, crossed that out in the slide. And that uh, was done after receiving formal notice from GARFO that the stock is rebuilt. Catch limits for Eastern Georgia's Bank Cod and Georgia's Bank Yellowtail were approved as recommended by the TMGC, the Trans uh, Boundary Management Guidance Committee, and uh, the New England Council's SSC. The SSC will meet next week, the 26th to 27th, to provide remaining stock specific catch recommendations and receive an update 
on development of ABC control rule alternatives. The ground fish committee will be meeting at least twice over the next two months to complete the framework and provide its recommendations uh, to the council for final decision making in December. Um, one storm that is brewing is Atlantic halibut. It's data poor and stack data, st excuse me, stock status remains unknown, but there is indication of recent overfishing. Canadian catch in 2020 and 2021 in area 5Z, which is Eastern Georgia's bank, was four times higher than it's been in at least the last 20 years. And so this is resulting in kind of a counterintuitive recommendation for catch advice. Obviously overfishing would indicate a reduction in catch advice is warranted, but because Eastern Georgia's bank catch is included in the US model, it influences these 2021 and 2022 catch recommendations to be at or above status quo. Um, the council is considering a 2023 management priority that would develop alternatives on how to address these kind of large swings in Canadian halibut catch uh, for US halibut management. So we'll have to stay tuned on how that proceeds. Next slide. Pairing. Uh, the council approved 2023 to 2025 fishery specifications. This is all based on the updated management track assessment, SSC catch advice, and the uh, previously approved framework nine rebuilding plan. The annual catch limits or ACLs are low, but they do represent an increase from recent fishing years. So for comparison, excuse me, for comparison in the table, you can see the area by area sub ACLs uh, on our left-hand side is the uh, fishing year 2022, so the current, and then you can see uh, proceeding off to the right, the subsequent uh, recently approved limits for 2023, 2024, and 2025. The council also had considered in September discontinuing framework seven. That's the action aimed at spawning measures on Georgia's bank. They ultimately decided to retain it as a priority uh, there probably won't be too much work done on that until the new year, so we'll just stay tuned on that as well. Next slide. Monkfish and skates. Mon monkfish specifications for 2023 to 2025 will be finalized in December as part of framework 13. Uh, in September, the council removed alternatives that would have increased days at sea and possession limits given a decrease in catch advice as expected. The fall management track assessment showed lower monkfish survey indices than in recent assessments, which you can see in these two figures. On the left is the biomass trend for northern monkfish, and on the right is southern monkfish. So the SSC will be considering this information at next week's meeting when deciding on monkfish catch recommendations. No work is planned for skates at the moment, but um, as Bob noted, there's that overarching issue of gillnet gear interactions with right whales. Um, the, the council process will likely entail a joint omnibus action with the Mid-Atlantic and several committees, uh, obviously smugfish skates and, and groundfish will have a chance to weigh in on this during development. Next slide. EBFM, Ecosystem-Based Fisheries Management, nothing really of substance at the September council meeting, but uh, starting next week through November 10th, the council's EBFM team will be holding some introductory workshops. These will be hosted in seven ports, including Chatham, Harwich, New Bedford, and Gloucester. And I've provided some, some of the details here in this table. Uh, the details are also available on the council's website. And of course I can circulate via email to commission members. Additional public outreach materials are available on the council's website and they include a short introductory video, which I think features our Dr. Sisson wine, uh, some infographics, stakeholder brochures, presentations, a whole bunch of interactive tools that you can find on the council's website. Um, next slide. Habitat. I'm gonna to touch on three distinct issues here. One is salmon aquaculture. Other is the dedicated habitat research areas or DHRAs. And then finally, the clam mussel fishery access to the Great South Channel Habitat Management Area. So in terms of salmon aquaculture, the council initiated a framework that is focused on authorizing possession of farmed salmon. This uh, was precipitated by the Blue Water Fisheries Commercial 
marine finfish aquaculture uh, project. This is the situated off of Newberry Port. They're looking to grow out steelhead trout and Atlantic salmon. The issue that is bringing this before the council is that possession of Atlantic salmon in federal waters is prohibited by the current FMP, which was established in 1987. Um, Amendment one to the FMP allows for salmon aquaculture only if it's consistent with goals and objectives of the FMP. So the council's action is to amend the Atlantic salmon possession prohibition in federal waters. That will likely require more than a year to develop. Um, and the PDT will be referring back to the council's aquaculture policy that was established in 2020, as well as some interagency coordination plans uh, and, and examples from the West Coast as it proceeds. The DHRAs, there are two dedicated habitat research areas. And this is if you look up on the upper left-hand side, the purple and the green boxes. Uh, these were established back as part of the council's omnibus habitat amendment two to better understand how habitat management areas influence stock productivity and to help design more effective conservation measures. Part of that designation was a very deliberate sunset provision to review each DHRA after three years. The review is meant to determine whether they should remain in place or dissolve. Uh, the council did recommend to NOAA to retain the Stellwagen DHRA, which is that purple uh, box that is circled in that uh, figure for another three years, but remanded the decision on the Georgia's Bank DHRA back to the committee. Um, as you can see, the, the Stellwagen Bank one overlaps the Western Gulf of Maine closure. Uh, so it wouldn't, even if we had done away with it, it wouldn't have opened up that area necessarily to fishing. Uh, that's a bit of a different story uh, for the Georgia's Bank DHRA. So the committee just wanted to, or the council wanted the committee to have a little bit more of a deliberative process uh, before deciding on that. Great South Channel uh, and clams and mussels. So access to that HMA has remained an issue for the surf clam ocean quahog fishery, which is managed by the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Council. Um, it's been an issue well after adoption of OHA2, that omnibus habitat amendment. The, the amendment had granted access in part, but other areas of particular interest remain like Rose and Crown. And those areas were closed to all but research fishing designed to better define where concentrations of surf clams could be harvested without disturbing sensitive habitat. So what came before the council in September was a review of some research that was designed to get at that question of whether there could be targeted um, access without disturbing habitat. This is a Kuna Mesut Farm Foundation led research project um, that was looking into possible surf clam exemptions or if, if the research wasn't enough to say, yes, we can provide access, at least to provide some feedback back to GARFO in terms of any subsequent uh, fishery um, permit applications for additional research. So the CFF final report indicates that the area is very, um, you know, heterogeneous and that habits, habitats occur at finer spatial scales that the, can't, the council can't really manage at. Um, so while the council didn't prioritize any changes to surf clam mussel dredge access, it did forward to GARFO recommendations uh, in terms of analysis of the current EFP, uh, you know, what it would like to see uh, for future projects that could be thoughtfully designed uh, in terms uh, and, and, and that any compensation fishing should be implemented strategically. Um, I think before I leave habitat, I'll just note some recent council correspondence on offshore winds, the next slide. Uh, this figure is taken from the agency GARFO's comments to BOEM on the Gulf of Maine wind energy area. Um, you, you can see they've included quite a number of areas recommending for exclusion, uh, including habitat management areas, ground fish spawning, and, and other areas. So just, just a heads up that GARFO has submitted a letter to BOEM. The council has also uh, submitted a letter and I believe Jared has or will be shortly distributing those letters just so you, you have them and can refer to them. Next slide. 
sanctuaries and monuments. Um, so because the clearest process to implement fisheries regulations is under Magnuson-Stevens Act, the council uh, is pulled, has been pulled into two management, two, two sanctuary matters, and obviously the ongoing Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument. Generally, the council, uh, uh, the New England Council, and in fact, all the regional fishery management councils have advocated over the years that fishery regulations in any sanctuaries uh, should, be, should be done under the council process under Magnuson Stevens. Um, you know, that has been the process that's been followed with respect to fishing in the Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary and it will continue to be advocated for as Stellwagen renews its management plan. Um, some proposed changes include, uh, so Stellwagen is in the process of renewing their management plan and some of the proposed changes include addition of management actions and outcomes over time for each action plan to better identify what has been implemented since the previous 2010 management plan. And I think uh, a final plan is expected this fall. Kelly Whitmore is really um, leading the charge on that one. So if you have any um, questions on that or concerns, do reach out to her. The emerging sanctuary to the south, the proposed Hudson Canyon, uh, it's in the process of scoping and the council certainly uh, will be discussing comments for submission at its December meeting. We've been given kind of a little bit of an extended timeline to submit. Uh, I, I would expect those comments to follow along the same lines as previous sanctuary comments and you know, again, advocating for appropriate fishery regulation process um, through the councils. So separate to the sanctuaries is the National Monument, the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument. That's in the middle there in purple. The fisheries regulations within the monument have kind of pinballed between uh, the federal administrations and under the most recent presidential pro proclamation, the monument will close to red crab and lobster fishing by September, 2023. Um, both councils, New England and the Mid-Atlantic had previously declined to amend the FMPs. No fisheries will use secretarial action to implement an omnibus amendment. Uh, the latest timeline has NOAA holding public hearings this fall and consulting with the council early in the new year. Next slide. Climate change, this is, this is my last slide, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, just a quick reminder of the East Coast climate change scenario pl planning. This is a collaboration among all the East Coast fishery management bodies and it's really designed to prepare our fishing communities and managers for, for you know, the, the era of climate change, managing through that. The goals uh, of this project have been to assess how climate change might affect stock distribution and availability uh, over the next 20 years and to identify the implications of uh, that for fishery management and governance. Uh, I know several members have been involved in the scenario creation phase and that's where we are right now. We've created four scenarios uh, ocean pioneers to the left, uh, upper left, checks and balances to the upper right, sweet and sour seafood, bottom right, compound stress factors to our bottom left. And, and these are really described different possible futures for our East Coast fisheries. And if you're interested in understanding um, these in greater depth, there is uh, uh, some narratives on the website hosted by the Mid-Atlantic that gets into what this means for productivity, what it means for the assessments, governance, you know, who the potential winners and losers are. And I'll certainly send that link around after the meeting. So what's, what's developing here is that we're entering into the last two phases of the planning initiative. Um, so in September and October, there'll be some brainstorming sessions with fishery managers. And the idea there is to identify the issues and options that, um, that will be before management and trying to, to govern through these scenarios. So that will continue to be discussed at the council, at ASMSC, I would expect that it, this winter, and it's all gonna feed into a February, 2023 summit uh, of the East Coast Climate Change Scenario Group. And that is all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Melanie, as always a very thorough report. Thank you very much. Questions or comments for Melanie? Khalil? Khalil, you're recognized. Thank you, Melanie. Again, uh, the, the, the uh, presentations that, that, that presented to the 
Fisheries Commission are really excellent and you know very complete. Um, and I, I, the, the last chart that you have there and still up on the screen, the sweet and sour seafood, and it's it's really it's really important to focus in on that. Uh, it says a world where the science is good, but the news is bad. Success comes from anticipating lower stocks and preparing for new catch limits. And, and I, I don't think we can uh, emphasize enough the the uh, the abiotic factors that are that are affecting the fish: uh, warm water temperatures, ergo low oxygen, uh, pollution, uh, heavy compounds, and uh, I, I think that sweet and sour seafood, that very last statement there, is, is something that all of us need to pay attention to, and we are, uh, and I just can't emphasize enough that you can, you can have all the science that you want, and you can, you can have all the information, but if the, if the, and the population may be surviving at this time, but if the environment, environmental conditions aren't good, uh, whether you have overfishing or not, or whether stock is overfished or not, um, if the environmental conditions aren't good, it's going to be very, very difficult on the, on the species, uh, no matter what we do. I, uh, it was a great presentation. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Khalil. Questions for Melanie? Comments? I'm not seeing any other hands raised, Mr. Chair. Okay, Commission members, let's take a 10 minute break before we go to other business. 10 minute break, Jared. This meeting has been reconvened. We're now in session. Moving on to other business, upcoming state fisheries management meeting and hearing schedule. So I'll, I'll take this briefly. Um, this is just a heads up on some of the things that are coming. Um, coming down the road, we have a um, commission subcommittee on permitting that is meeting on Thursday uh, that we'll report back to you with at the uh, November meeting. And uh, the law enforcement subcommittee is meeting on uh, next Wednesday. And again, we'll report back to the commission um, on that at the November meeting. Then we have um, two public hearings, one scheduled for the night of November 1st and the other scheduled for the night of November 3rd. Uh, both of those hearings will be virtual and will be uh, um, dealing with a number of proposals that were brought forth to the commission um, over the course of the summer and early fall uh, that we'll be coming back to you with at the November meeting with um, rec final recommendations. Uh, then there is a um, shellfish advisory panel meeting on uh, Tuesday, November 15th. And we'll also be looking in the November and early December period to bring together the uh, fluke fleet and horseshoe crab um, fishery to discuss the uh, management of those two quota managed fisheries. Uh, that will likely be, you know, back to back meetings as there's a lot of uh, individuals, particularly trawl, uh, trawl vessels that participate in both fisheries. Uh, and then we'll also be convening the Menhaden fleet probably in early December up in Gloucester, uh, following the ASOFC meeting to discuss uh, state management of that fishery. And then we're looking at a commission meeting on November uh, 22nd up at the um, Westboro Field Headquarters uh, in-person meeting to just to go over um, the uh, various recommendations coming out of the early November public hearings, as well as the subcommittee meetings. Um, and then we have a December, we'll be looking to have a December commission meeting, uh, more brief like today's and, and uh, informative on proposals coming out of the council and the ASMC. So that's my update there, Mr. Chair. Questions for Jared. 
I'm Mr. not. Mr. Chair, I do. Khalil here. Jared, Jared, Khalil. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jared, could, could, could that be all those dates? Could you in a, in a, in a one after the other? Can you just uh, put that down, yeah. and write in and send out to us? Sure, I'll be. I'll, I'm going to send you an email immediately following this meeting that has the today's presentation and some of the links that Melanie was discussing and letters that Melanie was discussing, and in that, I'll embed a uh, a schedule. That'd be awesome. Thanks so much. Yep. Any other questions for Jared? Not seeing any further hands raised, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jared. Commission member comments. We'll start with Lou Williams. Lou. Comments? All set, Ray. Thanks. Thank you, Lou. Tim Brady, comments? Yeah, um, uh, great meeting. I appreciate everyone's um, you know, efforts on behalf of the right wheel um, issues that we're having. I mean, it's huge. It's, um, it's super frustrating that uh, we're not getting credit for the, the really good work that Massachusetts has done and the the hits that uh, particularly the lobstermen have taken, but gill netters too. Um, and just, you know, everybody doing <clears throat> what we think practically is best. I just want to amplify what, what Mike's, Mike was talking about um, on uh, <clears throat> like the closures. It, it doesn't make sense to me from a big picture picture and to a lot of people outside this industry. And of course, to people in the industry that we're not doing more to simply identify where these whales are all the time. Um, whether it's tagging, whether it's more flights overhead, whether it's drones, whether it's heat signatures, we have all this technology. And it's like the people making the big decisions, particularly at the federal level, it just doesn't seem like they really want to address that when you're looking at industry-wide um, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars in um, impacts that, you know, it's, it's not at all limited to fishing. It's, it's um, all the marine transportation, it's ferries, it's tankers, it's freighters. It's, there's so much going on out there, but that I, I think people outside of what we do don't understand. So that's a, a real frustration, I think, big picture from all around the maritime world is, do we really care to protect these animals and if we do why don't we use all the technology we have to identify where they are where they're moving and i don't think anybody can argue with the moving zone but um that's not new but uh, as far as what i'm seeing on the water we've got an incredible run of black sea bass in cape cod bay right now um it's closed to us recreationally of course we get we get them only in october and they're already closed cod is closed um <laughs> So this same old thing for me uh, as a recreational fisherman, you know, I go out there and I'm a mile off the gurnet throwing cod back and throwing black sea bass back. But um, so that's that's my little piece of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Bill Doyle. I'm all set, Ray. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Khalil. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple of comments. One's a commendation for uh, Division of Marine Fisheries. Uh, if you, if you didn't get a chance to go to the Topsfield Fair, I'd uh, like you to know that uh, the Division of Marine Fisheries had a wonderful booth there. It was well manned, and there were some hands on uh, specimens there for uh, marine specimens for people to see and touch if they so desired, and uh, lots of handouts, uh, the, the posters, and the literature, and the information stuff. And so I just want to commend DMF for great booth at the Tossville Fair. They, they were located in the sportsman's cabin. Um, also, uh, if we could, my, believe it or not, my, my, my 2023 schedule is starting to get filled up. And if we could set our MFC, MF, I mean, my uh, Marine Fisheries meetings, commission meetings, if we could set those dates as soon as possible, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, especially the ones that are coming up in, um, June, May, June, and we don't meet in July and August. I'd appreciate that because I have trips that are being planned and I very much want to be able to attend the commission meetings. And the, the last thing I want to ask is, uh, it's a question. Um, I, I was planning on going to the uh, Long Branch 
for the Monday meeting, the um, straight bass meeting. That's going to be from three to five, but I have a previous commitment, evening commitment that I cannot get out of, but I would be able to tune in from three to five. Uh, is there a way for, is it, is it televised or uh, broadcast somehow that people can listen remotely to uh, the committee meetings? The subcommittee meetings, clear will be held, both of them will be held virtually. No, Jared, he's asking about the oh. ASMFC meeting. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. They do a great job with the, um, the, in fact, you can even, even virtually participate if you're a commission member. So, um, yeah, if you go to their website, uh, you can just open the meeting and, uh, and listen in. And uh, it's, it's as good as it can be. All so, right. Perfect. Thank you so much. I like to attend, especially the uh, straight bass subcommittee meeting. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Again, Thank you. again, it was a great meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Khalil. Michael Pierre Knock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just as an update, the next two days I'll be uh, at ICAT down in uh, Silver Springs. Uh, the purpose of the meetings are to go over the status of the different stocks, the pelagics that are managed and come up with a preliminary U.S. position on um, matters in these specific stocks. I would like to mention that for bluefin tuna, uh, they're changing the way in which it's being managed. It's uh, under development the past eight years uh, through date through this date to develop a management strategy evaluation approach. There was some public meetings a few weeks ago where they provided uh, different outcomes associated with an MSE approach. And uh, unfortunately, the outcomes were not good, which had us all scratching our heads, considering the fact that we have such a tremendous biomass of bluefin from Maine to the Gulf of Mexico. So hopefully uh, within the next two days or before the annual meetings that they have at for ICAT, which I believe is in Portugal in November, we'll either be able to address this uh, or get a, have a delay of another year to try to make this right. Because it's just astounding to think that with the outcomes that they had with the MSU runs, uh, that uh, the best of outcomes still had us with a cut. Uh, so that unfortunately is a uh, update that is not too positive, but um, uh, that's it. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Suki. Uh, I'll sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Suki. Well, I'll uh, just make a comment. Thank you very much for your attendance. Once again, we had a full house. Bill Amaro had to sign off at 10, but other than that, um, I, I'm relieved and happy for the participation of our board members. I had one question, maybe Melanie can answer it. I don't know if she's still on. Uh, I was told to understand, or I read someplace about an antitrust lawsuit with the limited access scholar fleet. Have you heard anything about that, Melanie? Or has anybody heard anything about that? Uh, Ray, I don't, but I could look into it and get back to you. Okay, thank you, Melanie. Once again, thank you for your attendance. I'm gonna move on to uh, public comment. Any hands, Jared? Yeah, Beth Cassoni. Beth Cassoni, you're recognized. Good morning, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, commission members. Um, I'd like to echo Suki's comments earlier about the state's effort for getting back the credit for the mass restricted area among all of the issues the lobster industry is facing right now going through phase two. Um, we've been meeting with Senator Warren, Senator Markey's office and talking to them about the need to, you know, get the Marine Mammal Protection Act reauthorized, which is, you know, it, it, it didn't get well received. I don't think there's much interest in taking that on right now, but we're working on it. And um, I just really want to say thank you to everyone. It was a great meeting. And I signed on a little bit later and I, I did hear something about promotions and I think I heard Dan refer to Bob Glenn as the deputy director and 
If there's anything that you can share with us for our uh, records so that we know to how to address each individual, that would be great. And congratulations, Bob, and others that got a promotion. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Jared, any other hands from the public? I'm not seeing any other hands, Mr. Chair, if we want to move to a motion to adjourn. Yeah, I'd like to move. Please, somebody move a motion to adjourn. Tim Brady, motion to adjourn. Thank you, Tim. Suki, second. Thank you, Suki. I'm not seeing any objections, Mr. Chair. Then this meeting has formally closed. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.